On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. And welcome to About Books. In a few minutes, we'll chat with the YouTube star turned author who's out with a new book that's equal parts history and cookbook. But first, here's a look at some of the latest news from the publishing world. Well, New York City Mayor Eric Adams recently stepped back from a proposed 4% budget cut to New York City public libraries. The move comes after library officials warned that such cuts could end weekend service at libraries and scale back public programming. Despite the potential cuts, New York City's robust public library system helped land it on a new list of best cities for book lovers. The list from the website Lawn Love ranked 200 American cities based on a variety of categories, including bookstores per square mile, number of public libraries, and number of book festivals. The five best cities for book lovers, according to Lawn Love, are New York City, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, D.C., and Miami. San Francisco was credited with having the most bookstores per square mile, while New York has the most public libraries. Rockford, Illinois, cited as a city with the most little free libraries per 100,000 residents. Now, on the other end of the scale, the five worst cities for book lovers, Laredo, Texas, Port St. Lucie, Florida, Chesapeake, Virginia, West Valley City, Utah, and Brownsville, Texas. Well, the subject of school book bans came up at a recent congressional hearing after House Republicans introduced a bill aimed at giving parents more say over what happens in public school classrooms. Here's some of the back and forth over the issue. You'll hear from Democrat Jim McGovern of Massachusetts and Guy Reschenthaler of Pennsylvania, a Republican. Look, I, I've, I've heard some of my colleagues say that this is not about banning books, but uh, give me a break. Uh, look what's happening in this country. Um, Republican-led legislatures are going on a censorship spree that would make the Chinese Communist Party blush. We have, ha we have 25 states that have passed laws telling students what they are and aren't allowed to learn about in school. We have Republican leaders calling to investigate librarians. We, we now have 1,500 1,500 banned books in schools across the country. We have teachers in Iowa being told they can't teach that slavery was wrong. We have teachers in Texas being told that if they have a book on the Holocaust, you have to have a book that teaches, and I quote, the opposite perspective. We have Republicans in Tennessee trying to ban a Pulitzer Prize winning book about the Holocaust. We have Republicans in Wisconsin trying to ban an award winning book because it mentions Japanese internment during World War II. If, if this were happening uh, in another country, our State Department would be sounding the alarm, but it is happening here. And against that backdrop, here we have a bill that makes it easier to censor ideas and ban books. That makes it easier for one racist or homophobic person to dictate to an entire class, an entire school, what kids can and can't read. I want to ask unanimous consent to enter into <clears throat> into the record uh, a piece from New, uh, Newsweek. Big Tech's digital book burning threatens a free and open society from 17 March 2021. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this book, I'm sorry, this piece is great because it chronicles how Amazon and other online bookstores will, in essence, digitally burn a book, meaning they'll take it off um, offline. And they did this with Alec uh, Berenson's unreported truce about COVID-19, 
They claim to, claim to his quote unquote misinformation. Turns out most of what was in that book turned out to be true. It wasn't misinformation. It was information that the left didn't agree with because it didn't fit their narrative. Additionally, they took down Ryan T. Anderson's When Harry Became Sally. They said this was hate speech. Interesting, because at the same time they took that book down saying it was hate speech, they were still selling Mein Kampf. Um, they also, by the way, were selling The Pedophile's Guide to Love and Pleasure. So Amazon can sell Mein Kampf and books on pedophilia, um, frankly, a guide to committing pedophilia, but when it comes to getting out the truth on COVID-19, can't do it. When it comes to a, a position on transgender surgery they don't agree with, that gets burned. So again, it's convenient that all of a sudden now my friends across the aisle have discovered book burning. But what well, we the gentleman yield for a second? Uh, no, it's my time. Okay. But, sure, Mr. Chairman. No, I just yeah. wanted to point out Amazon is a private company, and we're talking about public schools here. Thank, okay. uh, thank you. I appreciate it. The difference is, is the silence from your side of the aisle when this was going on. Would you like to condemn Amazon for digital book burning? I don't believe in censorship. Okay, so you're condemning Amazon for removing these books? I'm waiting for somebody to condemn the, the banning of books in all of our public schools that are going on as a result of Republican legislatures and Republican governors. So, you know, we can both condemn together if you want to do that. But, uh, but I, would, I would really appreciate somebody saying that uh, it is wrong that I Am Martin Luther King is banned from some public schools or the Rosa Parks book is banned from some public schools. Uh, that, would be, that would be helpful. Well, Chairman McGovern, I'm going to give you the chance to, to criticize some banning of books. The Burbank Unified School District banned of mice and men. They banned Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. They banned some Dr. Seuss titles, and they banned To Kill a Mockingbird. By the way, it was the right who was criticizing this. No one on the left that I'm aware of criticized this. Would you like to condemn this book, book, uh, book banning? I, I read To Kill a Mockingbird when I was in school book, and obviously we need to put some things in perspective, but I'm not for banning books. Well, thank you for your intellectual honesty. I mean that sincerely. Like, how about answering my question? Wait, what was your question again? All the books that have been banned. Oh, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to okay. that. I'm getting to that. Thanks. <laughs> the fundamental mi uh, misunderstanding here is there's a difference between banning books, which Republicans don't agree with, and making sure that books are appropriate for certain age groups. And fundamentally, that parents via school boards, make those decisions. That's it. And you can watch that full House debate on cspan.org. And now we want to introduce you to a YouTube star turned author. Well, joining us now is YouTuber Max Miller. He is the author of this new book, Tasting History. Mr. Miller, first of all, how did you get into cooking in the first place? Uh... Yeah, it's actually a funny story. I was on a vacation at Disney World with my friend, and she got sick. And so we spent the entire vacation in our hotel room watching The Great British Bake Off. And I became enamored with it. And I had never cooked or baked anything before. But I loved that show so much that I decided to teach myself how to bake everything that they were baking. And so over the next couple of years, I, I did just that. And that's how I got into baking. And that's how I got into the history of food, because they used to talk about the history of food on the show. What made you put this up on YouTube, your experimentation? A, a friend at work. So I would bring in my, my creations to my coworkers and let them try them. But they had to listen to a lecture on history at the same time. And one of my coworkers said, hey, you should put this up on YouTube. And so I did. And it, it worked out. How many subscribers do you have now? I think I just passed 1.7 million. When and how did history become a part of your cooking show? It, history was really actually the beginning of it. I've been a fan of history since I can remember, since I was a little boy, just listening to my grandfather's stories, which to me was history. Um, and so really, food for me was a way to explore history. And it's a way to kind of put myself in the shoes of people who lived in the past, getting to eat what they might have eaten. So history is the crux of the show. And then food is, is just kind of the way I present it. Would George Washington recognize what we eat today? I think many, many things, yes, but definitely not in their current form, you know? 
food was definitely simpler. There were we have so many more influences from international cuisine now and so many other ingredients that just weren't available. But then there were a lot of ingredients then that were more popular. They used to put nutmeg in everything during the late 18th century here in the US. We don't use that very often anymore, um, but uh, so there are there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. Well, what was the purpose of nutmeg? It was just a flavor that was that was very popular. Flavors kind of come and go in popularity throughout throughout the ages. For most of the last hundred years, salt and pepper have been the spices of choice. That's what's on a table when you go to a restaurant. But that's not always been the case. In the past, it was nutmeg, or for a long time, it was sugar. If you were wealthy, you would just have sugar on the table. Different spices come and go. And that changes even now in different parts of the world. You're not going to find those spices on a table, say, in Japan. It'll be something else. Uh, so it's, it's always evolving. How were you able to find some of these ancient recipes and how far back do they go in tasting history? So the oldest recipe that that I've found uh, comes from about 4,000 years ago from the Yale Babylonian tablets. And they're literally cuneiform tablets that have some very early recipes, probably the earliest recipes that we have. Most of the recipes that I find are simply from old cookbooks, old texts and, and whatnot that I've found on, uh, you know, a lot of museums and libraries have put their works up online so I can just go through and, and find whatever I need. But then there are some that come from poems or, or stories or, or diary entries. And those are always a little bit more difficult to find, but uh, they're often the more interesting ones because they are not written as recipes. So there's a little bit more detective work on my end that I have to or get to do. Now, are some of these recipes included in Tasting History, some of these ancient recipes? Absolutely. So the book goes through the last 4,000 years. They start in Babylon. They go through ancient Egypt and Greece and Rome, through medieval Europe to ancient China and the Middle East, all the way up through about the 19-teens. So let's go back to that 4,000-year-old recipe. What was it, and were you able to recreate it? I was. So there are a number of recipes in, in those texts. Uh, the ones that I did were a tuhu, which is a beet stew that has some lamb in it, and then a lamb stew that is, is more focused on the lamb, and it has some milk, and then risnatu, which are like proto-croutons that give it a bit of a texture and a crunch. Um, and I recreated both. The thing is, with that that old of a recipe, there are words in it that have no translation. Uh, scholars can't really agree. They're their best guess, but that's it. Uh, so there are always some holes, and, and you just have to kind of be okay with that and make the best version that you can. Did you ever have trouble finding uh, some of the ingredients that you needed for these older recipes? Absolutely. Some, um, unfortunately, simply don't exist anymore. And if they do exist, they're, they're changed. Ingredients have just changed over the last hundreds and, and definitely thousands of years. And then some are just difficult to find, like uh, the sheep that should be used in those old recipes is fat tail sheep, which those are still around, but they're very difficult to find, especially in Southern California. So I had to use regular sheep, uh, sheep meat, which was fine. But uh, yes, sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes it's just so difficult difficult that I have to be okay using a more modern version. But the point of the book really is to let people make these at home. So I never want it to be too difficult to, to find something. I always give you an alternative that you can use. So you've done some modern updates to these recipes in a sense. Absolutely. You know, I started the channel uh, when I was during lockdown. So I was in my, my condo and didn't have a lot of access to, to anything that wasn't a the, the corner store. Um, so I, I made the show to be dishes that you can make in your kitchen, that you can get most of the ingredients. But once in a while, I'll throw in an, an ingredient that is just too interesting to to not try to use. And so sometimes you have to go on to, onto the internet to find those, but that's part of the fun as well. Max Miller, were there some recipes where you just got started 
and couldn't finish because the taste just didn't appeal to your modern sensibilities or you just couldn't find the right ingredients? You know, it, when it comes to the tastes, that's part of the fun of the show. Those recipes that ended up not being very good didn't make it into the cookbook, of course, but on the show, I, I go all the way. And even if it's a, a terrible tasting dish, I still taste it because it's the history then that becomes so important. But I'll, I'll be quite honest in the show and say, you know, don't make this. This is, this is definitely a dish that has become extinct for a reason. Well, Florence Nightingale appears in Tasting History. What's the connection? Yeah, so I, I do a recipe for a bread pudding that was served during the Civil War in hospitals uh, on the Union side. And that recipe comes from originally a recipe that was used during the Crimean War and would have been served in the hospitals that Florence Nightingale worked in. And it's it's very interesting because it's not like bread pudding we know today. It's more like a, a steamed pudding, which are still popular in, in England. And um, it's it's just interesting to see how the foods that were being served to those who were wounded were quite different than to the people who were actually doing the fighting. It was it was kind of like if you're going to the hospital, you'll at least get to typically eat better. Uh, so that was the one upside of being wounded, I suppose. Did you find that there are times in history where shortcuts were made because they had to be such as during wartime? Absolutely. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of rationing videos during uh, World War One and World War Two, and before that, of course, rationing was always an issue, and so you would have to to deal with, you know, not having access to ingredients. The sugar beet, actually, in general, came about during the 19th century when sugar wasn't being imported to mainland Europe because the English had blockaded it uh, from Napoleon. And so they developed sugar from the sugar beet to, to get sweetness into their food. Well, we can't talk about the history of food without talking about Rome. Would we recognize some of the ancient Rome foods that they ate? Yes, uh, there are some that are, are not too changed. There are some early forms of French toast and, and omelets. But one thing that is extremely different is many of the recipes that we could even kind of recognize use some very different ingredients that we would never, ever use, like garum, which is a fermented fish sauce that was used in almost everything. Even their desserts would sometimes have this fermented fish sauce, which just lends a, a very complex and a bit of a saltiness to their food. But it's not something that we typically would, would use today. Who was Rufus Estes? Rufus Estes was a man, he was born into slavery, and after the, the Civil War, he began learning how to cook. And he worked his way all the way up to being the, the head chef for the Pullman Car Company, which uh, were very, very fancy train cars for the elite of America. And he really created a cuisine that was used in those train cars for, for decades afterward, and he became one of the the top celebrity chefs in America. His story is absolutely fascinating. And his his cuisine is interesting because it's a it's kind of a combination of the foods that he grew up eating along with the foods of the very wealthy and the elite kind of combined together and it's wonderful, wonderful foods. Max Miller, over this span of history that you've looked at, ha have there been some consistent ingredients or consistent foods that are still eaten today? Yeah, it's it's usually the easiest ones to, to grow, the easiest ones to get. Onions and garlic and oils of any kind, you know, really those basic ingredients, they just appear all over the world and, and all throughout cuisine in general. Um, but one of the, the things that is always appearing in, in different forms is spices. Every civilization has always wanted some sort of spice to, to kind of flavor these foods. And while those spices have changed, obviously, uh, the 
the desire to get them, even some of them are very laborious to to produce. Uh, it's everyone loves spices in some way or another throughout history. What about breads and grains? Absolutely. Um, I mean, bread is the staple of most diets, honestly, uh, in in some way, uh, shape, or form. And the way that it's made hasn't really changed all that much. You've got flatbreads and you've got risen breads or leavened breads and yeast, salt, flour, and water. That's all that's in most of them. And there are just so many types of bread throughout history. But just with those four ingredients, it's pretty amazing uh, how many variations we've come up with those few ingredients. Max Miller, when you look at this history, what about culture and religion playing a role in the development of recipes? Religion and, I mean, food is culture. That's that's just uh, definite. You can, you can track the way that people have migrated throughout the world based on the foods that they have brought with them and, and intermingled and how it's changed uh, as they've met with other cultures, sometimes uh, not so friendly. But when it comes to religion, food has always been such an important part of people's lives. I, I think that we don't really appreciate it the way that people used to because of the, the amount of time and labor that went into getting food, that it has always been a part of religion because food was truly life. And even one of the earliest recipes and I say recipes for beer, it's it's actually for a it's a hymn to Ninkasi, who was the goddess of beer. And it's from ancient Sumeria. And it's just a, a list of what you do to make this early form of beer. And it was considered a sacred drink, but it was also a drink that you could drink every day. Uh, so they're they're intertwined and always have been. What's the connection if there is one between pretzels and monks? So pretzels have a lot of stories that grew up around their creation and nobody really knows how they were created. But many of the original stories say that they were created by monks. Some say that they were created to mimic the, uh, the, the shape of crossing your arms against your chest when you are in prayer. Others say that they were created by monks during a siege of Vienna when the Ottoman Turks were coming in and they, they ended up making these pretzels uh, down in the basement as they heard the Turks burrowing underneath the city walls. Um, but they're, they're always connected with monks. And if you go back to medieval art, the pretzel is often shown on the table during the Last Supper, which it definitely didn't exist uh, at that time, but it did exist in the medieval version of the Last Supper. So you often have different saints and Jesus and pretzels side by side. Well, Max Miller, you're appearing on C-SPAN, so we can't go too long without talking about politics. First Lady Lucy Hayes makes an appearance in Tasting History. Yes, Lemonade Lucy. Uh, she probably didn't call herself that, but many people did, probably in a, in a little bit of a, a, you know, a not nice manner. She was a teetotaler and was part of the prohibition movement uh, years before prohibition went into effect, but part of that temperance movement. And so she promoted lemonade as a way to get people to stop drinking alcohol. Instead, they could have lemonade. And so she and Rutherford B. Hayes uh, made lemonade very often in the White House. It's unclear how on board he was with this, but she was. She seemed to be in charge when it came to the beverages at the White House. And so she got the nickname Lemonade Lucy. And on the opposite end of the spectrum was the London gin craze. Yes, very opposite end of the spectrum. So the London gin craze was a period in the 18th century when so much gin was being consumed by the population in London, pints of gin a day per person, uh, that they, they essentially had to ban it. There were more gin outlets in London than there are businesses in London today. It was really, really... A <laughs> 
crazy time because much of the gin was adulterated. And so it had things like arsenic and and different ingredients in it that could kill you. And it became such a problem that the uh, the government actually had to step in and kind of push people away from gin and instead got them into beer. Max Miller, another recipe you have in tasting history is the soul cake. What is that? Yes. <clears throat> so soul cakes are really one of the early forms of trick-or-treating. People would go around on All Souls Day, which is just after Halloween, uh, and sing to their neighbors asking for these little cakes that would often have a cross on them or, or other symbolism. And it was a way to, it was basically, you give me these little soul cakes and I will pray for for your loved ones who have passed on. And it was the early form of trick-or-treating. Obviously, now we go for candy, and it's more of a, a fun thing. But in the early days, it was it was rather serious, and uh, but still a lot of fun. Who's your co-author, Anne Volkwein? Anne Volkwein, she is, she's absolutely fantastic. So when it comes to actually recipe writing, there is an art to it. There is an art to getting what I do in the kitchen to be replicated by someone who is just reading those words on a page. And it's a skill that I and and many cooks just don't possess. Uh, so Anne does have that skill. And so she took my ramblings and formatted them in a way that will actually let you make things in the kitchen. And of course, we have to remember the, the role of Maureen in this book and your YouTube success. Yes, so Maureen is the one who got sick on our vacation and uh, kept me in the hotel room while we were at Disney World and watched The Great British Bake Off. So she's the one who I credit for giving me my passion for, for baking, even though it was just by watching a TV show. She's also the one that in those early episodes, I would think about when I was writing my scripts and, and talking to the camera it was, this is how I would tell my friend Maureen about whatever I was baking that day. What did you learn in the writing of this book and looking at the history, if you had to put it in a sentence or two, what did you learn? Uh, two contradictory things. One is that our tastes have changed wildly. Uh, in many ways, they've become much more sophisticated. We just have access to so many more ingredients and tastes, and our cuisine is more varied today than any time in the past. On the other hand, we haven't changed that much. Our passion for food, our attention to what food means to the cultural significance of having fancy food on the table and being able to take people out to to nice restaurants instead back back then it was having the food at your house but it was a way to impress people we haven't changed all that much so two contradictory things max miller is the author of this book tasting history explore the past through four thousand years of recipes we appreciate your being on book tv Thank you so much for having me, Peter. And you're watching and listening to the About Books program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, each Tuesday, dozens of new books are published. Here's a sampling. Fox News contributor Kat Timpf, a regular panelist on the Greg Gutfeld program, has released her first book published by Broadside Publishing. The libertarian commentator, who has also worked in stand-up comedy, titled her book, You Can't Joke About That, Why Everything is Funny, Nothing is Sacred, and We're All in This Together. Columbia University professor Michael Doyle warns about a looming new Cold War in his latest book. The former chair of the United Nations Democracy Fund has titled his book, Cold Peace, Avoiding the New Cold War. And finally, evangelical pastor and best-selling author Rick Warren, who wrote his best-selling The Purpose Driven Life more than two decades ago, is out with his latest book. It's called Created to Dream, The Six Phases God Uses to Grow Your Faith. Now also each week, national publications review the latest books. Here's two. NPR took a look at the newest from Clint Smith, 
the best-selling author of How the World is Past, recently released a poetry collection titled Above Ground. Quote, even though this collection addresses a subject as tremendous as the changing world we live in, the poems read with ease, NPR reports. It helps that Smith is writing about fatherhood and legacy, both of which are marked by good, engaging narratives. Ultimately, these poems are attempting to answer the questions on every child's mind. Where did we come from and where are we going? That's from NPR. And the Wall Street Journal reviewed Chris Saliza's new book about the pastimes of modern presidents from Dwight Eisenhower to Donald Trump. The book is called Power Players, Sports, Politics, and the American Presidency. Quote, the result is a lightweight but diverting recitation of sports prowess, high school and college gridiron feats by John F. Kennedy, Dick Nixon, Jerry Ford, Ronald Reagan, and Biden, George H. W. Bush's flair for baseball at Yale, Reagan and Kennedy's swimming heroics, Barack Obama's jump shot, and more, writes Wall Street Journal reviewer Edward Cosner. Besides the stats, the author's focus is on how these politicians use sports to polish their public image. As always, you can look for these books and authors in the near future on C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, thanks for joining us for About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Book TV will continue to bring you publishing news and author programs. And a reminder that you can get this podcast on our C-SPAN Now app, and you can also watch all of our author programs anytime at booktv.org.